I actually wanted to combine two messages. That was the way the burden was in my heart. Uh, I couldn't sleep well in the night, so whenever that happens, I just turn it to a prayer time, so that next time the devil will not make the mistake of disturbing my sleep. Because the Lord giveth his beloved sleep. I listened to Reverend Amolei's message in the room, online. Fantastic message, very great message. I heard when he said that I sent him to go and preach. <laughs> without giving him money. <laughs> Thank God he also said that I didn't have. <laughs> All those times we worked together, what I admired most about him, which I had mentioned to us in this group before, was the day we were to travel together to be there. We gathered the students together, all the students in the tertiary institutions in Niger State together. And we were to go. But a day before, I received the revelation that there would be an accident. And that that accident was going to take my life and that the only way out of it was for me not to go. Because I had seen many, and God would tell me, delay for three hours, or go two hours ahead of time, you know, something like that. But that one, he said, if you go, you will not come back alive. So I told Reverend Omole, I told him the revelation, it wasn't a vision, it, there was no voice, it was a knowing. I just knew. I just knew. And sometimes when you allow God to walk with you concerning what I call spiritual signals, they are as good as visions. They are as good as hearing an audible voice. So when I told him, I said, well, I don't think we can go. There will be an accident. And I won't come out of it. He said, me, go. <laughs> you know the way he does his head. I gave him my car. It's okay. But before I did that, I closed my eyes. I said, oh. He just looked the other direction. <laughs> I said, the accident will still happen, but you won't have a scratch. But left to me, I would have preferred for us to forget about him. He said, there are thousands of students we are bringing together. Let's not leave them. So I stayed at home. He went with the car, kept on praying in tongues, praying in tongues. But his courage to have taken that step impressed me so much. I was very impressed. And he's that kind of man till today. He hasn't changed. So he went, they finished the meeting. He was coming back when he got to Okoe, about 20 kilometers to Ilori. I think he started realizing, ah, okay, there's no accident after all. <laughs> Suddenly the steering couldn't control the car again. And where I was to sit, he hit a rock and the vehicle somersaulted 
across the road. He came out on hurt, but now remembered that uh, some money was inside the car, which was now <laughs> all the tires were upwards. He crawled back in <laughs> to collect the money. <laughs> so that was when a piece of glass just injured him on his palm. So by the time he got back, we were living in the same place at the Federal Government College in Loringdon. By the time he came back, I had already gone to bed. So he knocked right at my bedroom. He used to call me Oga. <laughs> He's a funny brother. <laughs> Oga, I'm back. Oh. I said, what happened? I hope you were not injured. I hope you are safe. So I ran out with my <laughs> rapper. I just ran out. I was touching his legs. I hope he didn't get hurt. He said, have you heard about the accident? I said, I heard about it before you left. <laughs> May God open our eyes to see the future. Amen. And also strengthen us to prevent calamities Amen. in the name of Jesus Christ. Because our God is great. It's, there's nothing at all that is too hard for him. Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing. God delivers from death. This Indonesia we went to, I was praying for a congregation. They were mainly indigenous. So one of them, in fact, almost all of them fell under the anointing, but there was one that didn't. So as he went back, I told them to call him back. Because as he went back, I saw a coffin that followed him. Which time did coffin start walking about? So I told him, please come back. Prayed for him again. And I asked the entire congregation to join that, the, that death was imminent. So that if we didn't pray, maybe. So it was after the service that his elder sister, who was in the church, told us that he was just resuscitated a week before. That he was almost gone. Revelation is one of the vital keys in ministry. And it comes by grace. And today, for instance, if I tell you that there are four levels of power, four levels, from step to step, grade by grade, which one would you want to settle in? Because that's what I want to talk about. And... Um, I had told Apostle Shita that I will come preaching this time because Madhuba is not around and uh, so that we will need the heat. But uh, with the way Apostle Babatunde maneuvered the altar, not pulpit. <laughs> I think I better use my style so that there will be a contrast. Or else everybody will think everything is fire, fire all the time. So I will just share it with us as brethren, as if we were just sitting in my sitting room. I've started what I call a mentorium. I want to mentor some people on hearing from God. It's online. I'll talk with them about hearing from God for seven weeks, Mondays. After that, I will now meet with them quarterly to mentor them. Because it is one thing to hear a message. It's another thing for someone who has passed through it to help you. If you have somebody to help you, the person can save you three years. 
So that in three weeks you can learn what will take you three years. It's like the guitar. If you have somebody to teach you, it accelerates how fast you can learn. So that was why I started the mentoring class. It's not that I, there's anything very special about me, but there are a few things I have learned in uh, 52 years that I just think I can share with some people. Amen. These four levels of power, the thing that interests me about them is that each one you enter by grace. And each one you optimize by grace. And I can tell you the four straight away, but because of the psychology of human beings, when there is suspense, people keep awake longer. <laughs> if I give you all of it, some of you will start sleeping. They left to me, I would have just given you all the four. And then even maybe talked around them for 10 minutes, and then we discuss. We interact. Because the principles are the same, but the patterns are not the same. The patterns differ from person to person. But the principles are the same. Well, maybe I should, I should use that method. Maybe I should use it. Because the second part, as I read our passage in Acts 4.33, says, and, like I said, was what I shared with us yesterday, the things that preceded that, place, that verse. With great power, with great power. Power is it. Power is it. Power is, is what really counts. So, and I know that there are many great speakers here. But since I'm primarily a trainer, so I'm taking the training perspective of power. So I will look at just those four Maybe, let me talk around them for like 10 minutes. And then we ask questions. We interact by questions. Because what kept ringing in my heart through the night was, you have dwelt long enough on this mount. Turn and take your journey. A number of us need to move forward. We need to turn and then take our journey. We're on a mount, and we dwell there. We're relaxing, we feel happy. Whereas there's something much higher, and something still much higher. Power, power is it. With great power, with great power. And I want to link these four levels to grace, because it makes it easy. When you know it's by grace, it makes it easy. And when it's by grace, the other perspective is now our responsi uh, responsibility. In God's sovereignty, he has provided grace. In our responsibility, we need to accept grace so that we can gain access to the fullness of power that God has for us. These four levels of power came to me when I studied Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So as I studied it, I saw le four levels of power uh, I've experienced a bit of each one, maybe some more than the others, but they are all attainable because of grace. The first one is what I call the power of knowledge or the power of education. 
the power of education. And I got that from Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth he was God man, but as Jesus of Nazareth before the anointing, there was no record that we had of whatever he did that destroyed yokes. Anything you, you read about that is from the, what do they call them, all these um, other books they attach to certain Bibles. Apocrypha. They say he molded uh, a bird and then threw the mud up and it flew away. Uh, well, it's possible. <laughs> but <laughs> we don't have a biblical record of that. But he grew in wisdom. He kept knowing at the age of 12, he rattled the doctors. He grew in knowledge. You can go to Bible school, you can study the Bible, you can know a lot. There's power in it, there's power in education. There's power in being enlightened. In fact, a number of people who caused revolutions in the whole world through education, through philosophies. And we know of people like Aristotle, Socrates, and some like Paine. Some, some were very negative. We know of the Epicureans who through philosophy tried to establish the fact that man is on earth just for enjoyment. Just enjoy yourself, man. for tomorrow we die. They said that part of what some of them did was they would eat and eat and eat, and when they were full, they would put a spoon in their throat, vomit it, rest for 30 minutes, and go and eat again. Because of the theory. Some of the theories have been very, very strong, very powerful. All those are still in the class of education. But when he's Christian, then it's for good. There's nothing wrong in going to a seminary unless it is a cemetery. Because if it's a cemetery, then it will produce death. It will release the letter. And you know, the letter kills. Wherever it's released, Letter kills. So education is good. It's good. It's good. It's good. But someone who is very educated in biblical things cannot destroy yokes. He cannot. He can change people's minds. Like some of our motivational speakers. I love some of them a lot, like um, Brian Tracy. I like Brian Tracy. I like Tony Robbins. I like Jim Rohn. I like Les Brown. I like John Maxwell. They are good speakers. I mean, great speakers. Those people can turn your head around. <laughs> like I was discussing with someone. Because someone told me that, that a number of them were teaching what I teach. I said, no. I said, they don't understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the spirit man. the end at the soul level. They can't understand the spirit man. Even if they analyze the spirit man, it is the spirit that is not yet regenerated that they can describe. It's John Maxwell that can play on both sides because he's born again and he understands, understands both sides. <coughs> so education is good, but if you want to destroy yokes, you need the anointing. And the anointing does not come from man, it comes from God. It comes from God. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. The anointing is like God deciding to 
separates you specially for a special work. I started off as an evangelist until one of the times that God spoke to me. He said, I have chosen you and anointed you that you may become a minister to my servants, to my servants, to my servants, to my servants, four times. So gradually, the only time you will see that evangelist part of me is if you give me a mic and there is an elevated stage and it's open air, whether I like it or not, I will go back to where I started. Not as much as Burawali, but a little. <laughs> Just a little like that. <laughs> And somebody will be wondering, ah, this Baba is jumping like a young man. <laughs> the anointing. We get it by asking, Oh God, you have sent me. And you won't send me for nothing. If God sends you, God anoints you for what he has sent you to do. Uh, John chapter 15. He said, we have not chosen him. He has chosen us and anointed us. He's the one who has chosen us. So the anointing comes from God. And one of the ways we can know it is, call it the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I don't know I don't know the day I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I didn't, I was not able to leave the church. I stayed in the church till daybreak. I couldn't sleep. There were, I don't know what that thing is. It was like electric shocks going from my head to my toe. And I was singing. I had so much energy. And I noticed that after that, for at least one week, I couldn't remember a single sin that I committed. As I couldn't remember a sin in thought or in word or in deed. I will call it my first experience of sanctification. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. God have mercy on us in the name of Jesus Christ. Because sometimes, when I pray for people for baptism in the Holy Spirit, there are some who pray in tongues, so I tell them to keep quiet. They will pray again. Because you sense it's not correct. Some of them are just imitating somebody beside them. Some of them are just talking on their own. So let's say baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let's equate it to the anointing. It's not absolutely the same, but let's equate it to the anointing. So that's level two. And that someone who is baptized in the Holy Spirit has the capacity to destroy yokes. One of the years that we had some of the best successes in Dulos Ministries when I was General Luasia was the year that I told our pastors, I said, any problem anybody brings this year, we will solve it first by spiritual force before we apply any other thing. Change it by prayer. Change it by proclamation. Change it by faith. Change it by the word. Change it by the laying on of hands. Before you think of any other thing. That year, 
Somebody raised the dead, I think twice. He's the general overseer of the ministry now. Sometimes it's, it's because we don't, we don't know what we have. Sometimes that's the challenge. Then sometimes it's, we don't activate what we have. But many times is that we don't optimize what we have. Even baptism in the Holy Spirit, if you run with it, <laughs> it will be serious. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. If you run with it, you will go back to what Reverend Amalek was talking about last night. There's another level. And I saw it from that passage, that Acts 10, 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. After the baptism in the Holy Ghost, most people who have been used by God either in revivals or in special tremendous works have encountered another measure of personal power. W. F. Kumuyi is one of my favorite ministers in Nigeria. I attended his Bible study when it was in his sitting room. I attended it when it came out of his sitting room. In fact, one of the times in 1973, I went to him for counseling. I was invited to come and play cricket for Nigeria. So I went to him and I told him, I said, so what do I do? He said, just go there and make sure you represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And make sure you play your best, you know. Be outstanding. I was very happy. That was how I went for their next conference. And the Bible study group I belonged to, the person who was in charge said, you mind some old men. They will be running around, chasing one round object that they call football. And I asked, is it sin to play sports? Especially if you have grace to be as, as she said, as far as I'm concerned, it's a foolish man that will be running around after a round object. <laughs> so I kept quiet. I said, This one is saying something different from what the boss what the boss said. At that time, anytime you listen to his Bible study teaching, you feel a warmth in your heart. Sometimes you feel like weeping. You know, that was the kind of warmth that I felt this morning. As our brother talks about revivals, I couldn't help it. Tears came down my eyes. And I'm always happy when I have that kind of, that kind of feeling because it just spoke my heart. That's what some of us have lived for. WF Kumuyi had that kind of impact. Then he suddenly came back. And what he would do, he, he would just preach for a while. After preaching, he would come out, he would go and sit down. And God honored him. And when he did that, the first few times he did it, Somebody who had never walked, who was over 40 years old, got up and started walking. He would just sit down. He said, well, let me leave it to God. Let's leave it to God, to the Lord. <laughs> I'm trying to imitate him. <laughs> the man got up. Several people, several miracles. 
and that now brought an explosion. So he was asked, what was the difference? He said he only went for a retreat and asked God for power. So if I tell you there are different levels of power, where would you settle? That was the question I started from. Where would you settle? Are you okay with education? Are you okay with the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Pastor E.E. Adeboye is my mentor. When I asked him to ordain me, he said, ah, but you are older than me in Christ. I said, sir, it's not by age, it's by mileage. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I might be older than you in Christ, but you have gone further. So please don't take me. He's my mentor, and he's older than me too, you know, biologically. We've been, in quotes, friends. You can't talk of my being the friend of somebody 10 years older than me, but actually, daddy is my friend. She said, if you, <laughs> if you see us talking, sometimes you, you will think the age gap wasn't there. He has a guy name, guy name he calls me. <laughs> that he can be very funny, very, very funny. So my plan is that next time, when he calls me that guy name, I will ask him, what about my wife's own? He's likely to say, ah, I think her mother will give her one. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, but I'll try. I can give you the report next year, if you're interested. <laughs> but after baptism in the Holy Spirit, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Because if you watch someone like Peter, it wasn't from the day of Pentecost that his shadow started healing the sick. It was as if, no matter how you put it, as if he grew into it. Even if you watch the miracles in the life of Paul, you find it's as if he grew into it. But from experiences of, historical experiences, people don't just grow into it like that, but they pay a price. And this price, they are enabled by grace to pay this price so that they can rise in the level of power. So daddy was praying one night. He was so desperate. He said, oh God, today this matter must be settled. It is either you give me the power to do this work or you take my life. And why he prayed that prayer, the only earthquake that has ever happened in Ogu State of Nigeria took place. And the ground started breaking and approaching him and stopped in front of him. And everything changed in the redeemed Christian Church of God. I had known him and redeemed since 1979 when he was in Ilori. But from that year, things changed. Now, by God's grace, they are in about 200 nations of the world. Anywhere I travel to, I just look for the nearest redeem, visit them, encourage them. Anywhere, even when they are not the ones who have invited me. But it's because God found somebody who could go up the ladder of power. So people like John Hyde. John Hyde was the one who asked for one soul a day, two souls a day. And the other, Brennan, was David Brennan. John Hyde was the one who prayed until his heart shifted. I read his biography of 400 books, finished it before daybreak. 
I couldn't drop it. And because I had to travel, I saw it in the house of my host. There are people that God has used. There are people who have seen levels of power. And today, my challenge to you is simple. Where do you want to stay? If where you are, you are dissatisfied, that means you have dwelt long enough on this mount. And you want a shift. Let me call this new level, the level of authority. Authority. Then there is one more level. Level of authority, you're doing good, you're healing all that were oppressed of the devil, but for God was with him. The level of divine presence. That one, there's no single experience that gives it. Any day you pay the price for it, you enjoy the divine presence. And because it has zero tolerance for sin, you can be living in sin and operate the anointing. I hope you know that. You are not sure. Just the way you can be living in sin and speak in tongues. But for the divine presence, you can't. <laughs> and please don't go and make a mistake of seeking divine presence and carrying it and think you can toy with sin. God has a way of flogging such people. He has a way of flogging such people. Let me just paint some pictures to differentiate. We said um, education, no yokes destroyed. Um, anointing, yokes are destroyed, yes. But anointing normally requires an atmosphere. You need the rapport of the people. Sing and re-sing and, you know, and then use whatever it takes to get their hearts to you. And once you lose their attention, the anointing begins to suffer. But with authority, you don't need an external atmosphere because the atmosphere is inside. So when you begin to speak, it generates the required external atmosphere. It generates it. The people, as if whether they like it or not, they come into tune with what you're saying. And then the person with authority doesn't need a lot of physical gesticulations and operations. A lot of times the word just does the work. But anointing and authority, a number of times for many of us, are specific to certain kinds of miracles and healings. But the divine presence, anything can happen. Anything. And the divine presence is, let me call it, the anointing that carries revivals. The anointing, like we have described it as anointing level, generally does not produce revivals. It can produce renewals. You know, people are renewed and the authority too. But for revivals, for such an outpouring of the spirit in a particular place that overflows to the surrounding and goes beyond boundaries, usually it's divine presence. If you check lives like Ivan Roberts or check someone like Seymour, you find out that if you read in between the lines, they understood the divine presence. And like I said, zero tolerance to sin. And a number of times, if someone enjoys it for a protracted period, if you lose it, uh, what happens? 
very difficult to get back. Very difficult. Far more difficult than anointing and authority. So, when is the divine presence, even the person walking into a hall alone makes a difference. His shadow, his dress, a comment, a look. He just looks at somebody and takes away his eyes. And the person is restless. A sentence that has no bearing to the salvation of souls or whatever. The, the, the next person just doesn't know what to do. Until he gets born again. There are several stories that one can give, but I would like us, first of all, to pray briefly, then take one, two, three, four, four questions, and after that, we'll pray again from the revivals of the first meeting to this one, that God will grant us revivals. Because this great grace is unstoppable. And if the divine presence can be gotten by grace, then it is attainable. Then in quotes, it's easy. What made me to fast on water only for 40 days was because the Adeboye mentioned it. I was his crusade director for three years. And I noticed for those three years, he doesn't taste food in February. He fasts on water for 40 days. Well, now he's over 80. I don't know if he still does it. But in those days, while ministering at the special Holy Ghost and convention, sometimes you will see it's as if he's going to collapse, but he won't. Because when you have a long fast like that, it is not real weakness, it is lassitude. That there was a day I was on the 19th day of a fast, and we went to visit someone who lived on the ninth floor, and the lift wasn't working. So I climbed it without stopping, though not very fast. But if I had malaria, for instance, I wouldn't have been able to climb that far. So the kind of weakness one has during a long fast is more of lassitude. Because you're actually eating, but you're eating the fat that is stored in your body, not the external one. And that one releases more energy per kilogram or one per gram, you know, compared to the glucose that your body was using. So he made a statement that if there's someone who has been seeking for an extraordinary breakthrough with God, that maybe, that was how he put it. He said maybe the person should try a prophet lens fast on as 40 days on water only. And the day he made that statement, I think I was on 24 days on water only. We were holding our convention, so he asked me to come and preach for him. He's the only one I can leave my convention and go and preach for. Because it's like giving an order. So I just to be. But I nearly made it. I broke that fast on the 37th day. After laying hands on 200 people, started seeing stars. <laughs> Instead of angels. <laughs> so, but later, we thank God, God granted grace. We were able to 
to do it. There's the human responsibility, but it is grace. 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 Father, help us. Lord, help us to go higher. Grant us the thirst, the hunger, the drive to be better, to become greater than whatever we had experienced with you. Oh God, enlarge our coasts. Let there be signs and wonders and mighty deeds in our lives and through our lives. Amen. Oh God, glorify yourself in our lives. Just glorify yourself. And at this moment that we want to interact, Father, please bring forth the things that count the most and help us to tune in to the station that matters so that your power can flow through us in full and out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. <laughs> so let's have four questions. And I expect that those four questions will help us to elaborate on a few more things. I'm sure there's a second mic that we can pass around. Please, if you have a question, just wave your hand. They can bring the mic to you. And please don't thank me. I have thanked myself. Just ask the question. I thank me already. So don't, let's save time. Yes, please. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. My question is uh, based on two things you mentioned. Um, one, based on what um, Apostle Baba today mentioned, the church now is at a state where what they yearn for will be far different from what the Father yearns for. The Father yearns for souls. But the church, when I mean the church, I mean we the people at the building, we yearn for prosperity achievement, greatness. So as an aspiring minister, when you are talking about souls that are perishing and you are weeping inside you and God is saying, go and lose them. And you keep trying to press that forward. And those in the higher authority who you are serving under are telling you, you better just put that aside. The focus here is money. We need money for the ministry. Let us think of how to get the money. That had actually killed a lot of passion in young believers like me. And I began to ask myself the question, which one do we go for? I was weeping when Apostle Baba today was talking about what was happening. And I, the Lord was saying, listen to this man. Listen to this man. He's speaking my heart. And I was asking myself, Lord, give me the grace and the privilege to go back. And if nobody is ready to listen, let me play my own part. Probably the little drop of water may make a difference. I need you to just encourage us on that, sir. God bless you, sir. In fact, the way you concluded it is very good. I thought you would have said you would just go and start your own church. <laughs> mm. 
I was an Anglican for over 40 years. And um, part of our strategy when I was a NIFES staff, NIFES was Nigeria Fellowship of Evangelical Students, was to encourage a number of the students to remain in the Orthodox churches and grow in the Orthodox churches so that in the future we could have revivals there. Like now, the primate, the one in charge of the total Anglican uh, communion in Nigeria was a Nifes person. Many of their bishops, former Nifes, Tunde Adeleye and Ku, uh, Ben Emuchala, uh, the one in Zaria now, uh, Baba, Ishaya Baba. All these people, Ishaya Baba wanted to go to another church. I told him, remain in Anglican. One, you are a northerner and you are fervent and you are cool headed. What the, the people they have problems with usually are penty rascals. But when they are cool headed people, they, they, they love them. I was to have been ordained in the Anglican Communion in 1978. There was a hitch. The bishop said, he didn't know me well, whereas he was my father's junior. And the scholarship he used was offered to my father first. I said, OK. Again, 1983, we started it again. He said, OK, now I know him. But I had a personal challenge. I didn't know how I will baptize children when I knew I would not baptize my own children. I couldn't resolve it. There are some who have resolved it. Well, it's okay. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, it's not as absolute as some people see, but I couldn't personally. So that was the main thing that kept me. I had no plan to start a ministry. Maybe I would have retired now, been over 70. Maybe I would have been one of the bishops or whatever. Or maybe giving them enough trouble for them to stop me at venerable. And then I would have been vulnerable to... <laughs> so please, wherever you are, you know that God has put you there. Please. Obey God. While I was in the Anglican, when I went to tell the bishop that I wanted to start my own ministry, he said, Charles, you can't. Let me show you what you will do. What you will do for me. He brought out one book, a booklet, um, Grandmother Strategy for Anglican Communion. He said, Charles, read this. When you read this, I took it to the meeting of all the bishops of the Anglican Communion. And they said they can adapt or adopt it anywhere in the world. And it came from our diocese. Just about it to implement it. I said, can I have a look, my Lord? I took, I, I said, my Lord, I, I wrote everything in this thing. They didn't even edit it. Some of the errors are still there. He said, you wrote it? I said, yes, sir. He said, that's why you should stay. I said, sir, that's why I should leave. If I have made a contribution that all the bishops in their world meeting accepted and I've been feeling God calling me out, then I've done something. He said, Charles, you're making a point. Okay. Okay. I made a contribution. The church where I was worshiping, we planted for other churches, so my my reverend was promoted. He became an archdeaconry. So when they were making him archdeacon, I already had the ministry. He said I must be there. So I had to go back. 
Once it's God who has put you there, stay there, contribute to your quota. Do what God wants you to do. It was during my youth call I learned my lesson. You know, I served in Sokoto State. I gathered the coppers, we brought money, and we spent money, and brought our Anglican church together, organized the feast for them, and I preached, of course. I told them I used to be an evangelist. So uh, I made an altar call, about one third of the church came out. I said, the Lord is telling me that they are still sinners who have refused to come to the altar here. You want to continue to stand on your sins? You better come out now. <laughs> Some of them, of course, were frightened. They came out. More people came out. After that, they reported me. They set a committee. That number one, I have to prove that I saw those people singing. That I came to church and I was calling people in the church sinners. That I had to prove it. And number two, I had to prove who gave me the authority to come to the church and be preaching like that. So after my youth call, when I became a traveling secretary, I asked the Lord, Lord, which church do I go to? Show me an Anglican church. I went there with a different attitude. Lord, what do I do here? Clean the pews. I bought one duster for my car, one for the church pews. Every Saturday night that I was around, I cleaned the pews. Till one day the pastor caught me. Brother, what, what are you doing there? I'm cleaning the pews, sir. It's for sisters. I'm a sisterly brother, sir. <laughs> and I was already preaching on TV. And he used to see me. So, after six months cleaning pews, one day he wanted to preach, and the bishop wanted him urgently. So he said, there will be no sermon today. The bishop wants me. And by quarter to four that morning, God spoke to me and said, I said prepare to preach in your church today. First of all, I said, which one is my church? And I remember. So as the man was about to turn away, he said, ah, no, brother is here. Brother, stand up. I stood up. He said, some of you have been seeing him on TV. He preaches like the bishop. Please come and preach for us. That was how I started preaching. And at the end of the message, he came back. They told him that the whole church was shaking. He said, brother, they told me you shook the church in 18 minutes. <laughs> you know what he did? Different from what a number of us would do. He took me to the bishop. He was the one that introduced me to the bishop. And I said, sir, we have a preacher amongst us. Some of us would throw that person to a place called Kutu Wenji. You know what that bishop did? He bought a car, brought a cannon. I was not ordained. And got a driver and told me to organize the diocese for evangelism, that I should preach anywhere in the diocese. <coughs> that diocese has been split into three now. In fact, some people said, I preached more in that diocese than any other human being ever did. I preached in every church that was in that diocese. Organized them. I planted churches. 
before I left. We thank God. I'm sorry for telling a long story, but I'm answering your question. Some of us, have, the blood is boiling inside us. We are too much in a hurry. Too much in a hurry. In, especially in the East and then in Lagos, most of the Anglican bishops now are born again Christians. And many of them pass through Christian Union, NIFES, SCM. So, unless it's God that is telling you to leave, it's God that sent you there. You can make a difference just by doing what God asks you to do. It's God himself that told me, you will preach in your church today. I was not expecting it. Six months of cleaning pews. And at that time, I used to wonder, well, I can't understand this. I'm preaching on TV. I'm cleaning pews in my church. So, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. So even when you tread where youths will faint, where young men will utterly fall, you will not faint. You will not be weary. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Second question. Thank you, sir. Um, yes. Knowledge, uh, uh, anointing, authority, and uh, presence, CAP, K A P. I just want you to see if you can uh, make a bit of comment on levels, orders, and hierarchy between these uh, levels of uh, power. Thank you, sir. Levels, orders, and hierarchy. <laughs> um, knowledge does not destroy you, so anointing is higher than knowledge. Anointing requires external atmosphere to function. And many times requires physical energy and physical Exertion. Authority carries an internal atmosphere that so is higher than anointing. A number of very nice brethren move in and out. Anointing to authority, authority to anointing, anointing to authority, authority to anointing. You know, a number of times. But divine presence is the ultimate. That is when God takes over. It's the highest level of power. And the major key to it is waiting on God. He waits. You tarry, you tarry. Check anybody that God used mightily in revivals. Some people talked about George Whitfield. They said he was such a great preacher, he preached so many times. George Whitfield prayed through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation on his knees four times. There were times that George Whitfield prayed for 36 hours nonstop. There was a time I was teaching people contact 10, how to pray for ordinary 10 hours. Some people were saying ah, that God said, let your word be short. I said, it's true. When your work is short, your words need to be short. Whether there are people like Moses who went and stayed in God's presence for 40 days because of the, the intensity, the demand of what they were doing. And the key, the weight, the key to it 
If you want to wait effectively, wait on God effectively, the W is worship. A life of worship. How it helped me is I got to a point that once I start praying and I start worshiping, I don't give time to it. So sometimes all I do in my prayer time is only worship. Nothing else. Because there's no time until I feel I've exhausted the grace for it for that day. Or I feel, I just feel contented and I should shift maybe to warfare. And the more you do worship, the less you need to do warfare. Then the A is aspirations. If you want to wait on God, have a goal. Have a goal. But the W, worship. Exalt God above your desire. Then have aspirations. A goal. A goal. Then the I is inspiration. The breath of God coming on you. Like I mentioned in passing yesterday, my usual inspirational cycle, I have two major inspirational cycles. 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. But that of 3 a.m. to 7 a.m., especially from around quarter to four, is much more intense So if you put your waiting time where your inspirational cycle is high, you're likely to get a better result. I'm just talking, I'm talking as if it's a mentoring class. Just talking about some experiences that can help you. You can now fit them into your own pattern by which God handles your life. But the principles are the same. Waiting on God is waiting on God. Worship, aspiration, then inspiration, and then the T is tarrying. You stay until you are endued with power. When I'm having my devotion in the morning, I don't have time for closing until I say, unless I have an appointment and I have to come out. So that's why Generally, I don't pick phones before 12. Just occasionally, very occasionally, I may not come out till 8 p.m. Very occasionally, not regularly. But many times, between 12 and 2, you know. So, when one learns to wait on God, uh, you find out that you go further. God takes you further, helps you, strengthens you, and he upholds you with the right hand of his righteousness. Is there another side of your question you want me to touch? Uh, usually they come in that sequence, but you know God now, you cannot put God in a tunnel. But usually anointing comes before you learn authority and before you have his, enjoy his presence. But it's not that you cannot get all of them the same day. You can. But many of us don't have enough knowledge to sustain. Sustaining is where the challenge is. But if he's experiencing those things, once you are a child of God, grace is so powerful that grace can give you access. But many of us don't know enough to retain what we are learning. There was... um, an experience I had in 1986. If I had a good mentor, I would have retained it. There was nobody to help me. Every sick person 
that I laid hands on got healed instantly. And everybody I prayed for baptism in the Holy Spirit received in under 90 seconds. But I couldn't sustain it. And I think the main thing was that this organizational thing, they annoyed me. I became bitter. I became bitter. So I saw the thing going to just lifting. So I started fasting. As I started fasting, it moved faster. Just disappeared. I tried this last February to This was 1986. So it's always good if you have sound Christians who have experienced some of these things to talk with you. Uh, you may have more new dresses than they do. More uh, manifestations in different dimensions. But there are certain areas they that a statement they will make, if you take it seriously, you will save yourself three years of problem. Like if they tell you, don't have a female secretary. <laughs> Did I say that? Uh, <laughs> it's not a law, but just in case of emergency. Because sometimes if you don't fall for her, she falls for you. And it is disastrous when the two fall together. And you cannot blame gravity for falling. <laughs> Question three. I think that's, uh... Sir? Change your mind. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, the other time you answered the question, that's why I didn't want to give off. But from what you said, sir, I have experienced some things, and truly, because of um, lack of um, mentoring, I think I lost it. I remember one of those days when we started because I didn't plan to be a pastor and all that. But when we started, I remember leading people to pray and I was leaving the ground. I don't know what that is till today, but I know I started crying. Like, keep me down, Holy Spirit, I don't know what it is. My legs were actually leaving the ground and I couldn't tell anybody because the person who was my pastor then when I told him some things, I realized that he didn't know. You know, because for the first time, you know, I laid hands on people and they were falling. And I didn't know what that was, you know. So I ran to him and I asked him some questions and he told me, what's that? It must be a strange spirit, you know? You can't say it's witchcraft. And so, <laughs> but while he was talking, I realized that by the Holy Ghost, he didn't know what was happening to me. So, but the leaving the ground, I don't know what that was, because I was actually floating. Well, I knew I was moving up and down, but I was floating and I, I, I begged God, I said, I don't want it again. I don't know what it is. People were misinterpreted. There was nothing I didn't pray and all that. So I don't know. Uh, this is my first time of really coming out to ask. Oh, yeah. amen. You see, God has different ways of dealing with us. And usually, when God wants to use you in things that are spectacular, he allows you to experience some spectacular things with him. There was someone who had this kind of ex experience. In his own case, uh, I think four angels visited him. 
And then they now started worshiping. But all the angels were taller than him. So as they were worshiping God together, he suddenly noticed that everybody was the same height. Himself and all the angels. All the angels were not the same height initially. So he now looked down and found out that he was in the air. And then the two angels who were not as tall as the others were also in the air. So by the time they finished the worship session, he became his normal size. And then he now asked him, what, what? So one of the angels said, when there is intensive true worship, everybody is equal before God. And that it manifests physically. Where you will have a problem is if you now go and start teaching it. That's the child of God. Have you experienced, I think they call it elevation. No. The, levitation. Le, levitation, yeah. Levitation. If you are not experienced levitation, <laughs> but for you as a person what you need to do is if you can find out the lifestyle the things you did and God granted you that kind of privilege and turn it into a habit then it works there was a strange thing that happened to me um, that's about five years ago that led to my broadcasts every Wednesday. I had animals talking. And it's, it's very strange. There's only one person I've read about who experienced it. That's Urimolade. Uh, Urimolade, who finally founded uh, the CNS. I was with my wife. I used to fast from Sunday to Wednesday. And I was doing it, but this particular Monday, one cock came beside our window. All it was doing was But I was hearing what it was doing in human language. It was saying, don't lose today. Today is important. Breakthrough today, you won't need to struggle for this anointing you've been fasting for. Don't lose today. They drove the cock away. It came. I told my wife, I said, are you hearing what that cock is saying? It's a cock. Cock, 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 <laughs> cock is talking to you. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> then there was a problem in the office. They said they needed my attention. So I went there. A ram across the fence started saying the same thing. Each time he did, Aah! Is the same thing I had. Don't lose today. Don't lose today. If you lose today, you will never get this power again. But if you sustain it today and bring I told them, I'm leaving you people. Let this thing spoil in the office. Is it that you people are not here? Daddy is here ram now. <laughs> but to prove I went back to my room. My wife's youngest brother was my personal assistant. He could come to my closet. He could enter any part of my house. He grew up in my house. He went to the university. He married from my house. He's like my son. He came, he said, Daddy, this thing we are talking about, this thing we're talking about, you need to, uh, well, we know the ram is talking, but uh, you need to help us. 
I said, okay, you think I was just joking. I said, to prove to you that these things were saying what God was saying. Now, all the birds in the buffer are going to gather on top of my roof and they will say the same thing. While the word was still in my mouth, it was as if there were a thousand birds over my roof. I said, they are saying the same thing, but in a different way. They said, I should turn you around and gently push you out of my bedroom. So I turned him around. He's about six feet three. He's taller than me. I turned him around gently. I said, please go. From that day, to Wednesday it's it just flows it just flows so I got it but I'm not going to go and teach that as a doctrine so that's my comment on that